we preach Christ crucified. We declare the endless love of God demonstrated at the heart of human indifference and rejection. Death is conquered, for God has come to us. God, who death could not contain, chose to receive its brutal sting to release beloved humanity from its grip. We preach Christ crucified, the symbol and tool of oppression transformed to become a sign of hope for every generation. Grace outpoured, wrongs and shortcomings forgiven, humanity restored and the door to life eternal flung open. We preach Christ crucified and gratefully receive the gift that God has lavished upon us. And drawn by its promise, we gather in Christ's name amidst the world in which we too will have our crosses to carry and the God we meet, the Saviour we worship, equips us to walk in its shadow. Good morning and welcome once again to our NWBA online service and as ever it is our privilege to serve you as people and as churches as we continue to seek to come together in worship in these challenging and unusual times. Those opening words reminded us of how the cross of Jesus and the message of Christ crucified is at the absolute heart of our faith identity. And perhaps we can continue to express that truth through the words of our opening hymn, Jesus is the name we honour.
we will glorify, we will lift him high, we will give him honour and praise. Let's continue in our worship as we pray together. Gracious God, in the midst of the hopes and fears, the concerns and the expectations of our life's journeys, we come to you. We're different people with different stories, gathering in different places, with different experiences of living as your disciples, yet we are one in you. And together we come to you, believing that in our coming together and through our coming together, you are present with us. And we pray that by your spirit, our hearts might be open to that reality. We come to you because even in the midst of all that is happening around us, you are our unchanging God, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of everything, the one who holds the universe in your hands. Nothing and no one compares to you. And so we come with hope in our hearts, we come with faith and trust, and yet we also come with honesty. Honesty about ourselves, that we often fall short of what we're called to be and act in ways that are not worthy of your name. Honest about our world, which confronts us with many challenges and realities that disturb and distress us. Honest about our expectations, that often our faith can be driven by our desires rather than seeking your will and purpose. And yet we come in hope, for no matter what goes on around us, no matter how things might conform to our desires and expectations, you are no less God, you are no less powerful, and you are no less forgiving and gracious, no less loving, no less willing to restore and remake us. And so we reach out to you in mercy, confident of your love and forgiveness. And we thank you that in Jesus, you have come to us to make that real, to live as our example, to die as our saviour and to rise again as our redeemer. And so we turn our hearts towards you in worship again. And we open ourselves to recognise your presence and to discover again the joy and the assurance that nothing can ever separate us from you. And we thank you for that truth as it once again becomes real in our coming together, as we offer ourselves in worship to you. Amen. Before the first, beyond the last, the ever reigning one Age to age The one who was The one who is and is to come Oh Lord, so glorious You are so
light of your sun The lost are found The weak made strong And broken hearts rejoice as one in sin Well, I'm delighted that uh, we're being joined today by Johnny Hurst. Johnny is no stranger to those of you who are regulars at this service because, of course, he has preached, he's led on various occasions uh, and also led some of our live services from K Street. And uh, we're going to be hearing from you again, I think, as part of our August series on Ephesians, Johnny. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. we're looking, looking forward to that. But, of course, you also... Um, a very much the coordinator, leader, regional minister, looking after um, youth and young adult work. You also working nationally now uh, with that. And I know one of the, you know, we, we've all kind of weathered the storm of the last 15 months or so, but one of the impacts that uh, a number of churches are quite concerned about is, is the impact it's had on their, their youth work. And I think this is something you've been thinking about and reflecting on. Yeah, anecdotally, talking to youth leaders in our region, uh, the the engagement of youth workers has dropped off um, at various stages throughout the year, really. There, there's a number of people who are sustaining youth work online, who are continuously trying to communicate with their young people, but there are just some of those that we've lost contact with. That's true for me locally, and it's true, uh, I think, across our region. I, just recently, uh, picking up on some stats from Youthscape, uh, who, who indicate that, you know, coming out of a lockdown, coming out of this, this time, we, we might have a drop of maybe 53% of engagement with our young people, which is significant and a real challenge. Um, so I think, I think it'd be really good to get our local youth leaders together around the Northwest um, uh, to really to talk this over a little bit, to, to not so much try and find solutions for our problems, but just share our experiences to lament to talk about uh, how it's going uh, and what we're going through um, and so I think we'd like to do that get people together online this month uh, to share yeah and I know I mean you're you're in the very early stages of planning that at the moment so we can't give out a date or anything at the moment but we'll get that onto our websites and, and into our emails and it does strike me I mean it's an interesting reality because I guess what we'd say is that for many people of certainly my generation what the last 18 months has probably done is introduced us and made us a lot more familiar with the kind of media that our young people engage with. And yet at the same time, our churches have maybe struggled to, to stay in touch with young people. So mm -hmm. it's, it's an interesting kind of two edged sword, this really. Absolutely. I mean, young people are good at engaging online, but it's not necessarily where they want to live. 
Mm -hmm. um, and and they yearn as much as we do for relational experiences, for um, for co for for personal contact, face to face meetings, and and I think um, they found, of course, young young people have had a really hard time themselves with their education in and out of school, and that's all over the the, the news and the media at the minute. Um, but it's yeah, it's just a recognition actually that we assume young people can do things online. They can, but it's not where they want to live uh, mm -hmm. because we're, yeah. we're human. <laughs> we're designed yeah. to, to be in community. I think that's quite interesting because um, Jan and I on Sunday mornings, obviously I, I engage with the NWBA services as, as I ha kind of have to, but um, she actually goes to a Zoom service at one of our NWBA churches. And, and it's kind of interesting because Sunday mornings for me are probably the one day of the week that I escape from Zoom. And for her, it's probably the one day of the week she uses it. So you just kind of realize um, the world we're in. But but I guess, you know, I, I think the important thing for me is not, yes, in, in relation to youth work, but in a number of things, that we neither rush to go back and do everything we used to do, nor we just rush to change everything. But we need to think things through and reflect. And as you say, lament. And it's great that we can create that space specifically to uh, sort of, do that in relation to youth work um so thanks for organizing that and can i encourage everyone to be praying for our young people even if your church has got a thriving youth work or you've hardly got any young people let's really pray for the work that, that johnny does and of course one of the things that's been impacted um i've got to be careful how i use the word impact here but one of the things that's been impacted is our impact weekend uh, which of course was a big highlight for many of our youth groups and young people was run residentially at the Quinter Centre. We did a, a very innovative online experience that involved me and in making marble rooms. And I've even still got my little person. I, I, I can't quite remember when we did it, Johnny, but there was some point in the online gathering I had to make a person who has sat with me all year since. Um, oh, I think you sent, me, you sent me the feathers in the post and my, my, my daughter Emma made, made said person. Um, but So what are the plans for Impact and uh, the, the Youth Weekend in 2021? Great. So we're really hoping and planning right now for Quinta, for uh, Impact to be back at Quinta, uh, the, our residential place in Shropshire, uh, this October, the 8th to the 10th of October. We're really excited that, it's, uh, that we, we feel that, we, that it's right to go back at this time. We do, of course, need some extra safety concerns and measures in place uh, to do with COVID and, and what that looks like near the time. We're continually assessing that and preparing the ground for that now to make it a safe weekend but we hope that we'll get activities back together um run by ian sheldrake um one of our members from didsbury baptist uh, and his team of outdoor instructors with venture out as we you know hope to do some paddle boarding some tree climbing some archery we're also planning a bigger escape room uh, again for this uh, quinter for this uh, impact in october there's swimming uh, we're pl i'm planning on bringing back a water slide and other field games if we can get them out again a bonfire and of course phil mandy and others will be catering for us again and you know that never disappoints that's always a highlight of the weekend as well and, and there will be some teaching and biblical reflection and worship and all of that as well i think if oh I'm yeah there, there will yeah. be of course there, there will know, be, yeah of course, and we yeah. yeah we've got a We've got a great theme actually just working with um uh, a lady called anna kasha she's she's the uh, northwest rep for urban saints uh, and we're working on a theme together called the promise and it's about looking at god's kingdom covenant and community it's going to be a real vibrant and life-giving theme i think uh, to bring us back together uh, as we look at what it means to be god's people and and community today now, for some of our churches, uh, this is this is a very regular thing. It's almost part of their annual rhythm. But I'm guessing that some people watching this may have never been on impact weekends, would know very little about them. How do we get involved? How do we find out more if, if we're interested in being part of it? Yeah, brilliant. The, the best place to go is to our NWBA website or straight to our NWBAYouth.com webpage. Um, and uh, uh, you can find all the booking forms there. Uh, all the uh, all the information uh, videos to show the, the address people. down here as he speaks yeah absolutely brilliant uh, and so it's, it's your job to tell your church leaders your youth workers let your young people know let their parents know it's for ages 11 to 16 that's secondary school 
um, young people, uh, aged young people. And uh, if you're a little bit older or if you have um, 16 to 21 year olds in your congregation, we'd love to get them involved too as young leaders and get them interested too in our two year discipleship program called NWBA Disciple, which is tied into our impact weekend. Yeah, uh, yeah so nwbayouth.com. And we can find, well, we just go onto that website and we can find all of it. You're going to lead us in prayer in a moment, but I think before we do that, we need to mention the unintended star of this gathering once again. There's a lot of video we've made from your house over the last uh, year, and your dog always seems to manage to get in on it uh, in some way or other. Yeah. He's just come through the door. So it, what's his he name? Always want, he always wants to, it's, his name's Finton. He yeah. always wants to be a part of whatever's going on in here. Yeah, I, th I think he walked across the middle of one of our Christmas uh, services as well. So well done, Thank Finton, you. for interrupting again. Um, I must admit, my cat decided to be demanded to be let out one week when I was right in the middle of one of my online sermons. And uh, I ended up just having to let her join in as well. So that's all part of being online together. Uh, but Johnny, it's great to hear about that. And again, just get onto the website if you want to find out more about our youth programme, um, which there's more to it as well. Uh, than, than just Disciple and, and Quinter, although they are the, the big mainstays, so to speak. But you're going to lead us in our prayers of intercession this morning, I think. So uh, we'll hand over to you now and invite you to, to lead us. Absolutely. Um, we in our local church community have been using the Lord's Prayer as a framework, uh, as a six-sided shape of hexagon, really, to look at the six aspects of, of prayer. And we're going to, I'm going to use that structure now, that, which is hopefully familiar to us as we um, as we pray together so let's lift our hearts to god now in prayer our father in heaven hallowed be your name amazing creator god bigger than the universe thank you that you call us today to come and worship you and and that you know us inside out that you encourage us to call you dad and so father dad daddy today we turn to you in prayer and we pray for your kingdom to come for your will to be done to be the reality here on earth as in heaven lord for um for the people and the places we have on our hearts this morning lord for countries facing persecution and suffering at the hands of others lord lord for our own country uh, suffering uh, the effects of, of our pandemic still, Lord. We pray your kingdom come. Would your wholeness and your healing be made known uh, in and around the communities in which we live and work today? And Father, we ask for your provision that you would give us today our daily bread. And Lord, as we've uh, uh, talked about the state of our youth work in our churches lord we pray for our youth workers our youth leaders and uh, children's leaders lord as they have struggled to engage with uh, children and young people over this time but we thank you for the creative and innovative work and that the way your holy spirit has been working within us but we particularly want to remember today lord rebecca at penralt baptist as she begins her youth ministry there next week and for the church community across north wales as they um as they uh, minister in this challenging time father would you forgive us forgive us our sins and forgive as we forgive those who sin against us Lord, teach us what it means to for others as we seek it for ourselves. Renew a right and steadfast, steadfast spirit within us, we pray. And Lord, we pray for your guidance today. Lord, we pray for your, your guidance um, that we would not be led into places of temptation. Lord, that you would uh, uh, lead and guide your church uh, to be faithful during this time. Lord, we pray too for our goal scorers, Raheem Sterling and Harry Kane, as they put several goals in the back of the Italian's net this evening. <laughs> but Lord, we thank you for the joy uh, that sport can bring. And we remember and rejoice that it is in you that we breathe 
uh, your breath and we live and move and find our being. And so we pray for safety and protection as fun and uh, 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 enjoyment happens this evening around nations as they meet socially at this time. And so, Lord, we continue to pray for protection for our country, for our communities, for our churches, for our government and local councils that we live uh, and are a part of as restrictions begin to change and lift. Lord, we pray for our church leaders and communities as they work out what the change in these restrictions means for reopening our buildings and returning to church at the right time. And so over all of that, Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for love, for peace, for grace to rule in our hearts through these difficult and delicate decisions. And so, Lord, deliver us. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from sickness and illness. Deliver us uh, uh, from the plight of this pandemic. Because yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, this day and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. And uh, if this was the BBC, I would point out that other goal scorers are available. Um, and as a Liverpool fan, I might just mention Jordan Henderson as well. But uh, thank you for that, Johnny. It's great to connect with you as ever. And uh, as our worship continues now, we're going to be led by Paul Saxon. Paul, someone I think that you've you've worked with and, and sort of nurtured within our NWBA community. And uh, yeah, Absolutely, Paul. Paul's grown up as a young person within our, the church I'm in now and has developed as a worship leader uh, there and he's moved on uh, towards Bolton. Yeah, and he leads us in a song, You Are the Author of My Life. <laughs> of my soul and my song in the night endlessly faithful and kind shield surrounding me the God who holds my life faithful Savior you lead me beside quiet streams there you restore my joy strong tower for my soul and Jesus I'm running to you alone where else can I go but into your arms and place the full weight of my hope in who you are you are the keeper of my heart I've never known Jesus, I'm 
Well, in a few moments, uh, Stephen is going to bring us our scripture reading from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Stephen is the minister of our church at Greenfield in Ermston, which is one of the churches that has appeared this week in our season of prayer, prayer cycle. And uh, if you haven't done so already, although we're now going into the final week of that season of prayer, can I encourage you to find that place on our website and to use those resources to help us all to continue to pray for one another. And just because our organised season of prayer is coming to an end at the end of this week, I would really encourage you nonetheless to continue to pray for one another as an NWBA community. Stephen is bringing us our reading because Ralph, who has enabled this for so many months now, continues to be quite unwell and I really would commend him to your prayers as a community too. I think this might also be a moment to perhaps explain to you some of our thinking about the future of these online services as we do anticipate the lifting of lockdown restrictions as July comes to an end. It's our, attention, uh, it's our intention rather to continue these services through until the end of July because we recognise that although it may be possible to meet on that last couple of Sundays, some of our churches may nonetheless still need some time to think things through, to plan how they're going to open their buildings and also to think about how we remain in touch with those who have joined us online. So we're going to continue to offer our services in that way so that if you need them as an option you can join us. As we go into August we're going to offer something a little bit different and we're calling it our NWBA ser Sunday Sermon. What we hope to do is actually continue to offer a weekly sermon which will go live on YouTube. It'll be pre-recorded but it'll go live on YouTube and if you want to join us at 10.30 on Sunday morning you can do so. You can interact in the comments column and, and engage with one another in the way that many of you have. But we're also going to make that sermon available to people um, to be downloaded in the previous days. So again, if you want to, if you're coming back into your church service and you want to use them uh, on, on screen in the church building, you can do that. Or maybe you want to host them on your website so that you can connect with people or on your YouTube channel or your Facebook page so that you can connect with people using them uh, in that way. So we want to try and make the resource available in as many different ways as we can. So we hope that will enable you to find your own way back into your familiar rhythms and routines or in fact create new rhythms and routines as you begin to look to the future and again if there are other ways that you think we can help you then please get in touch the services through august the live services will be shorter and what we're suggesting is that perhaps if you're not planning to reopen your building as a church maybe you plan something around those services maybe you set up a zoom meet or or one of the other um, whatsapp or, or google hangouts or one of the other facilities that are available so that you can perhaps gather and pray together and talk together after that shorter NWBA service. So I hope that we can work together to make sure that we stay together, but we also can move together into whatever we feel is an appropriate future. But you know, one thing I do want to say, and I'm going to say more about this in our service next week, is let's remember that this won't be a freedom day for everyone. There will be those who are anxious, there will be those who are concerned, there will be those who don't feel ready to simply throw open the doors of our churches yet. And let's remember too, that doing that is going to put a lot of pressure on our leaders who've already had to carry a huge amount through the last 15 months. So let's please be a community of patience, be a community of kindness, be a community of grace, or to quote the words of Paul, to be a community who really show the fruits of the Spirit as we now find our way into whatever new routines await for us. But for now, let's hear from Ezekiel. Let's let Stephen bring us our reading from Ezekiel chapter 4. The reading is from Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 1 to 8 and 16 to 17. Now, son of man, take a block of clay, put it in front of you, and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege to it, erect siege works against it, build a ramp up to it, set up camps against it and put battering rams around it. Then take an iron pan, place it as an iron wall between you and the city and turn your face towards it. It will be under siege and you shall besiege it. 
this will be a sign to the people of Israel. Then lie on your left side, and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for three hundred and ninety days you will bear the sin of the people of Israel. After you have finished this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the people of Judah. I have assigned you forty days, a day for each year. Turn your face towards the siege of Jerusalem, and with bared arm prophesy against her. I will tie you up with ropes, so that you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have finished the days of your siege. He then said to me, Son of man, I am about to cut off the food supply in Jerusalem. The people will eat rationed food in anxiety and drink rationed water in despair, for food and water will be scarce. They will be appalled at the sight of each other and will waste away because of their sin. I want you to imagine for a moment that you've been forcibly uprooted from your home. You've been taken to a place miles away that you've never heard of and you've been dumped there to live. And you're doing your best to eke out some kind of life in this utterly strange environment. But you have managed to stay together as a church. And not only that, but your minister and your church leaders have come with you. And so you gather outside whatever home that they've managed to build for themselves because you kind of have that instinct that you need to stay together as a worshipping community. And sure enough, out comes your leader and stands before you and you wait in expectation to hear what they have to say. And what might you be expecting them to say in that moment? I guess that I'd be looking for some words of comfort and hope. Something to tell me that, yeah, we're bewildered and we're afflicted, but God hasn't abandoned us and we have good reason not to despair and to look to God to deliver us. And alongside those words of hope, I might expect to hear some words of empathy, something that captures my sense of sorrow and perhaps even anger at what's befallen us. Somewhere that I can at least recognise that others are going through something similar and I can find some comfort through hearing that they appreciate what I'm going through and they recognise the pain and the injustice of my plight. And I might also be looking for a sense of continuity. Perhaps they'll rally us round and we'll sing some of our favourite hymns or maybe recite together a familiar prayer or reading. We'll have some kind of opportunity to connect with the life that's been taken from us. Some sense of our faith being carried through into this new and troubling experience. And as someone who has the privilege of being called to Christian ministry, I've got to be honest and say that I think that's pretty much what I would seek to offer to people in those circumstances. A message of hope, a message of empathy and some sense of connection with the shared life that we had before. And of course, what I've just described is not entirely hypothetical because in many respects we find ourselves here today because we've kind of been on the digital equivalent of, of, of that. OK, we've been more confined to our own homes than uprooted from them. But we've taken to YouTube, Zoom, we've distributed cards and pastoral letters that I suspect would very much reflect those three elements. A sense of continuing hope in God, a sense of empathy and uh, that we're not alone in our struggle and a sense of continuity. Learning how to bring some of the key elements of what we had before into this new phase of our life. And yeah, these online services and sermons are very much an expression of that. But let's get back to the scenario that I've just described, which is pretty much the scenario that we are presented with at the beginning of chapter 4 of the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. The people of God have been exiled, or at least a cohort of God's people amongst whom Ezekiel finds himself have been exiled. They've been taken from their home city, where we discover in chapter 1 that uh, Ezekiel had been a serving priest. 
And so those who have really done their research on this book tell us also that Ezekiel is just about turning 30 when the particular events we're looking at are believed to have happened. The age when his training would have been complete and he would have begun his ministry as a fully accredited priest, so to speak. So what we're reading here could be the equivalent of his inauguration speech, his first moment as the senior presiding priest. And if that's true, of course, then that in itself would have brought some continuity to the scene. OK, we've been uprooted from Jerusalem. We've been separated from some of our families and some of our loved ones. But at least Ezekiel's inauguration is still happening. At least we've got one shred of familiarity with the life that we've been forced to leave behind. A shred of connection with our loved ones back home. And so they gather at Ezekiel's house, waiting and ready to hear what he has to say, looking to him as their spiritual leader to point them forward. Now, this might be a good moment to once again just leave that crowd at Ezekiel's door and to do a little bit of a recap. We are currently taking something of a lightning tour through this Old Testament book of Ezekiel. And if you joined our service last week or you've watched the sermon from that service, uh, which are both of which are still available on YouTube, you may remember that the scripture reading that we shared then portrayed to us of how Ezekiel has an amazing vision of God's presence and he's called by God to be a prophet. And we leave him munching his way through a scroll that he'd been handed and told to eat. Now, what we don't know, of course, is whether or not the people who gathered at Ezekiel's house knew anything about the vision that God had given him. Perhaps they did. Perhaps that's why they may have particularly wanted to hear what he had to say. Or perhaps only we know that because, of course, we've had the chance to read the previous three chapters. But either way, we have good reason to have some quite high levels of expectation. I mean, after all, this is not just a gathering to connect with any old religious leader, but one who has had such an amazing encounter with God that we're still able to read about it something like 3,000 years later. And we're told that Ezekiel has been overwhelmed and empowered by the Holy Spirit in a remarkable way. So, like I said, we have good reason to have high expectations for this moment. So let's step back into the scene. And sure enough, Ezekiel appears before the people. But there is no great speech. There is no great worship ritual. There's no song of lament or message of hope. But instead, Ezekiel is silent. But as we watch, he takes a tablet of soft clay and he begins to scribe on it. And so you draw a little bit closer, you know, perhaps he's going to write down some important word or phrase. But no, he seems to be drawing a diagram. And gradually, as it comes together, you realise that it's a map or a schematic of your home city. Yep, there's the temple, there's its courtyards, and they're all marked out. There's your old house, there's the marketplaces and the familiar streets. Now, as we read the book of Ezekiel, we do begin to discover that he was very often very graphic and very physical in the way that he communicated. Yes, he had his laments and his oracles, just like so many of the other Old Testament prophets, but he was also one of a number who quite literally acted out their message. So maybe this wasn't that unusual. It certainly happens a few times again as the book continues. Maybe people were used to seeing Ezekiel communicate in this way. And so as you watch that representation of Jerusalem appear before you, you might have good reason to feel positive. Yeah, you know, we need to remember that this is good, that we've got this depiction of where we live and, and where our roots lie. He's mapped out our home city while it's fresh in our minds to make sure we don't forget those streets and those squares and those temple courts. You know, maybe we can gather here and we can pray for the folk back home. Perhaps we can bring our children here and we can show them the city of their heritage. OK, Ezekiel may be silent, he's not speaking, but he's given us something to think about. He's got our attention. But Ezekiel hasn't finished. He starts making something else and he begins to fashion some weapons of war and siege. And then to your horror, he positions them around the city and you realise that he's depicting for you that Jerusalem's troubles are not yet over. Those of you who are now in exile have actually escaped the worst of what's got to come. And the things are going to be much tougher for those loved ones and those compatriots that you've left behind. So what is Ezekiel saying? 
What is God saying if he is truly speaking through Ezekiel? But wait, he hasn't finished yet. And now Ezekiel reappears with a huge griddle pan of some sort, probably taken from his own cooking fire. And he holds it above the model. Oh, yeah, you think, you know, the griddle is going to come crashing down on all those armies that are besieging our beloved city. It's going to destroy all their weapons of war. God will come to our rescue. God will scatter our enemies. But no, he brings the griddle pan down, not flat, but on its side. And it doesn't crush anyone. But it appears like a screen that separates the model of the city of Jerusalem from where Ezekiel is standing. And then for a moment Ezekiel disappears and then he comes back looking pretty dishevelled. He's bound with ropes and he lies down in front of this model. Not on the side of Jerusalem city where he can care for it, but on your side. And there he lies. And he lies. And he lies. He lies there all day and you come back the next day and he's still lying there and you come back the day after day that and he's still lying there. And all of this, of course, is what is narrated in chapter four of Ezekiel, which we've read. And we discover that Ezekiel lay in this position for around a year. And we also know that in some way or other, Ezekiel symbolized that he was taking upon himself the sins of the people. Now, we're not at all sure how he symbolised that, but let's remember that he was a priest and he would have taken part in the temple rituals where animals were sacrificed and before they were sacrificed, the sins of the people would be symbolically placed upon the animal as a sign to them that they were placing their sins before God, they were seeking God's forgiveness and God's restoration. And then the animal would be released and they would kind of be shown that their sins were being taken away by the animal escaping away into the mountains. So the people who watch this, we can assume, would have recognised something in Ezekiel's demeanour or his actions or his ritual behaviour that told them that this was what he was doing. But of course, there is one significant difference. As a priest, Ezekiel would normally have symbolically laid the sins of the people on an animal, the scapegoat as it was called, and participated in a ritual that reminded the people that their sins could be forgiven and taken away and expelled. But this was different because he laid the sins upon himself. They didn't go away. Day after day, Ezekiel lay there afflicted and inflicted with the wrongdoings of God's people. And then, in the final element of this powerful piece of street theatre, is that while he's doing that, Ezekiel quite literally half starved himself to death in front of them. There's a whole section about making and eating a loaf of grains and drinking water. And again, those people who've done their research tell us that the specific quantities outlined am amounted to an absolute starvation diet, just about enough to keep him alive. And so we're intended to recognise that this bread is representing the bread of suffering. It's re representing the fact that the people of Jerusalem are going to be starving. And I also actually asked Stephen to miss out a fair chunk in the reading to spare you the graphic detail. But we're also clearly intended to understand that the food that Ezekiel was eating was not only symbolising starvation, but it was intended to appear disgusting and offensive. The sight of anyone in Ezekiel's condition would have been pretty distressing. But the sight of their priest lying in such squalor would have been truly horrific. But of course, we, with hindsight, can recognise that Ezekiel is acting out the reality of what Jerusalem will suffer. And Ezekiel, whose ministry is founded on a vision of an unchanging God, a God who is present, a God whose spirit is empowering them, offers them a vision of a reality that God needs them to recognise. And I want to invite you for a moment to stay in the shoes of the people who saw Ezekiel day after day and to think about what his message was saying. Because it does strike me that the popular narratives of the world that we live in would no less struggle with what Ezekiel was seeking to represent than his contemporaries would have done at the time. You know, I often hear faith parodied as, as people or people of faith parodied as those who just look at the world through rose tinted glasses, somehow use God to ignore the realities that are going on around us. 
And there are those who will focus on God and say, there we go, we don't need to worry about the troubles of this world, just trust God and God will sort everything out. Or equally, there are those who look at the troubles of this world and say, well, there you go, how can there be a God? If God existed, all these terrible things wouldn't happen. Now, they may be popular narratives, they may be well-rehearsed narratives on both sides of that argument, but they're not the narratives of our faith. Because Ezekiel refuses to slip into this nice, tidy folk religion. Either let's take our minds off everyone else's troubles and just have a good religious time, or for that matter, let's give up on God and find a different way of making the world's challenges and troubles easier to bear. No, says Ezekiel. The God that you're invited to believe in is a God who is reigning and ruling, and a God whose reign and rule is not contradicted by such events. But as you look at them, you need to look at them in the light of that truth, and you need to look at them in the light of your own wrongdoing and sinfulness. Yes, as human beings, you can know the love and the forgiveness and the compassion of this God, but you also have to live with the consequences of human sinfulness. Unless you think this is just an Old Testament idea, let me assure you that we're going to be blasting through that thought very quickly. But for, for now, let me just invite you to look at the words of St. Paul in the book of Romans, when he speaks of creation being in bondage to the consequence of human sinfulness, groaning for its release yet confident that a day will come when this release will be granted. And you can check that out towards the end of Romans chapter 8. It's the bit that quite a few people like to ignore in their rush to get to the all things work together for good bit, which they can then take out of context. But let me for a moment take you back to those exiled people longing for home, longing for God to rescue them, longing for God to restore their kingdom to them, and yet confronted day after day with Ezekiel's bizarre street theatre telling them that this might be their aspiration, but it's not God's message. And if Ezekiel was lying on his side, symbolically, so to speak, just outside Jerusalem, separated by that griddle pan wall, so to speak, then let me take you to where he theoretically might have been lying a few centuries later. The road that led from that city of Jerusalem to a nearby village of Emmaus. And making their way along that road were two people, locked in conversation, troubled, confused. And then a stranger catches up with them and he asks them what they're talking about. And they tell him about their own traumas, about how they've witnessed a scene of violence and humiliation, about how they have watched in sickening disgust as someone that they saw as a leader and a priest and a restorer, someone whose body was fastened and bound and emaciated just like Ezekiel's, someone who at times in the weeks and months before had taken for himself the same name that God gave to Ezekiel, son of man, and they'd watched him suffer. And what disturbed and concerned them most of all is caught in their declaration that we thought that he was going to be the one who would have redeemed Israel. And to cut a very long story short, they discover through their conversation that the Jesus of whom they were speaking had risen from the dead, that this Jesus was with them on that journey, and that the events that they had found so repugnant and demoralizing were all actually foretold in their scriptures through characters like Ezekiel. And that they had all that they needed in those events of those few previous days to proclaim a message of hope and salvation to the entire world. But they wanted their past back. And to wind the clock forward a few weeks, and once again just outside Jerusalem, the followers of Jesus gather. And now they're convinced that Jesus is alive, that he's defeated and overcome death. And so they face him with the ultimatum. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus looks at them and he puts it bluntly and he says, no, because you're asking the wrong question and you're looking for the wrong thing. You don't need an earthly kingdom. You need what Ezekiel had. You need my spirit. You need my truth. And my spirit will come upon you in power and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And that is why I find this character of Ezekiel so fascinating and his message so profound. Let's go back to him for a moment. He brings God's word to God's people, not initially through his oracles and his speeches, but in Ezekiel, the word is made flesh 
and dwells among them. And through Ezekiel, they see a figure who is bound and humiliated and defiled just outside Jerusalem, taking upon his shoulders the sins of humanity, taking the place of the lamb of sacrifice and bearing upon himself the punishment that sin deserves. All the narratives that we now attach to the events of Calvary can be attached to the actions and the symbolism of Ezekiel. And I want to suggest to you, therefore, that in this strange and eccentric piece of theatre, we have a foreshadowing of the cross, rooted in the reality of human experience. And I think that has so much to say to us. But let me just draw out three things. The first is a small detail that we have so far overlooked. And it's that Ezekiel used to turn from side to side during this ritual, sometimes taking upon himself the sins of Israel and sometimes taking upon himself the sins of Judah. Now, to understand this, we need to delve a little bit more into Old Testament history, because in the centuries before Ezekiel and the other exilic prophets, the land had become divided. The tribes had fallen out with each other and they'd formed a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Israel and Judah. And what do we do when we fall out with people? Well, we tend to delight in their calamities and we blame them for our own. And that's exactly what had been going on. The northern kingdom became invaded and the southerners said, well, there you go. That just shows that God is looking after us and he's rejected you. And the northerners, of course, said, no, we've been weakened and you've betrayed us and you've left us to our fate. That just shows that we were right to cut ourselves off from you in the first place. And then the southern kingdom was invaded and the northerners said, well, there you go. You're only getting what you deserve. About time you had to put up with what we've had to put up with. That is so typical of human behavior, isn't it? And that's what happens when you build around, uh, build a religion around self-interest. And dare I say, it's a trap that I have heard many people try to pull our Christian story into over the years. But Ezekiel says, no, this is all about all of us. The sins of Israel and of Judah are at the heart of this crisis. And he takes upon himself the sins of everyone. And he foretells that the only way to salvation is for the whole of humanity to recognize its need of a savior. Not to set nation against nation or class against class or community against community or gender against gender in a game of blame and recrimination, but to come together and to recognize that, to put the words of Paul again, we've all fallen short. We've all made a mess and we need together to seek God. So let me be clear, if we see our faith as a kind of smug retreat from which we can simply look out and see the fault in others, then frankly, we've lost the plot. We share the common failing of every other human being on this planet, but we have a message of hope that reaches out to all. And the second thing is this, which kind of helps us see why ours is a message of hope, because there is a big difference. Ezekiel did not claim to be God. And Ezekiel acted out the immediate future that was hopeless because he recognized his common humanity with everyone else. He lay there starving, wasting away, eating disgusting food. And to add to this and really make the point in the next chapter, which we're not going to look at, he goes and shaves his head as well. But our Ezekiel, our son of man, that we see wasted and humiliated on a cross is none other than God himself, the word become flesh. And in our believing that God has taken upon himself the sins of the world, we have a message of hope. We have a message of salvation. And we can say to the Ezekiels of this world, get up, leave your ritual humiliation and your depiction of calamity behind. Not because it isn't true, not because you've got the message wrong, but because God is willing to lie where you are lying. Because in Jesus, God has lain where you are lying. And you can be released from the task because he has declared you righteous and your sins atoned for. But we have to remain rooted in that message of the cross. The cross is not the place where God simply says, hey, it's all okay, don't worry. 
It's the place where God says that every last detail of Ezekiel's model is no less true today than it was when he first lay in the dung and portrayed it. But with one exception. I have taken his place, says God. Such is my extent, the extent of my love for humanity, such is the extent of my grace, that I have taken that place for you. And my third point is to simply bring this to the heart of our own experience. You know, those narratives of exile have somewhat come alive for us in the last year or so, as we've experienced our own exile journey, although it's been very much a 21st century exile, exiled from our church buildings and fed with YouTube and WhatsApp rather than scrolls. But we're on our way back now. July the 19th beckons and like those first disciples on the road to Emmaus or on the hill of ascension our first instinct might well be to ask the same question can we now restore the kingdom to Israel can we finally get back to all the things that we did before can we finally get back to our routines and our rituals and our favorite places is that what exile has meant for us you know, it's completely understandable that these months of separation will have generated a greater affection, a greater longing for those things that we've been forced to leave behind. Just like the exile generated a longing for the streets and the temple and the lifestyle of Jerusalem amongst those who endured it. But through Ezekiel, God did not give the people the message they wanted to hear. He gave them the message they needed to hear. And Jesus did exactly the same. Why do you want this earthly kingdom when you have the cross? And through the power of the Spirit, you will be equipped to proclaim the message of the cross. And dare I say that perhaps by losing the trappings of our earthly kingdoms, we have perhaps learned to more clearly see the enduring power of the message of the cross. A message that is no less meaningful when we encounter it in our kitchens than when we encounter it in our chapels. So will we emerge more determined to rebuild our kingdoms or more determined to seek to lift high the message of the cross with renewed clarity and purpose. Because as I look at Ezekiel lying there wallowing in the sins of his nation, I hear again the message of Jesus. The cross is the only message you need because the events of the cross contain everything that humanity's salvation requires. And that was not an easy message to proclaim. It was not an attractive message. It was not a popular message. It was not a welcome message, but it was God's message. And in another of those New Testament epistles, Paul speaks of the message of Christ crucified as one that some people saw foolish and others as offensive. But that is our message, says Paul. That is our only message, because it's the only message that can bring true hope and salvation to a desperate humanity. And that is our message, a message of hope that I hope that this last 15 months or so has taught us to place above everything else as we now look to the future. So may God help us to make that our absolute priority. Let's not waste this chance by seeking to rebuild our earthly kingdoms instead. Amen. Maybe as we bring our service to a close now, we can use the words of the song Christ Alone Cornerstone to remind us again that the message of the cross so powerfully sort of prefigured through the actions of Ezekiel is the foundation of our faith and needs to be the priority of our shared life together as we seek to live it and we seek to proclaim it. Christ Alone Cornerstone. My faith is built on nothing less.
And so let's bring our service to a close as we pray together. Loving, living Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for your cross, for its message of hope, and yet we recognise too that the salvation and the hope that it represents was wrought in the midst of human struggle and suffering. And as we now look to the future, as we begin to discover what it means to be your people in whatever world emerges for us, may the message of your cross be a central and defining feature of our life together. For this is our hope. This is our purpose. This is our calling. And as we seek to live in the shadow of the cross and to proclaim the message of the cross, May the blessing and the mercy and the peace of God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with each of us, now and forever. Amen.
May the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us.